Hey, everybody, what's going on? Um, I believe we are actually live, so hopefully you guys can hear me and see me well. Um, it's good to see you all here. I see we got a couple of people in the in the lobby. Hope you're all having a good night. What's going on? Um, I've got, uh, yeah, a lot to talk about tonight. We're actually doing my very first live stream ever here on YouTube. This is not only my first time doing this, but this is the first time for the Orbital Alliance YouTube channel. So um, this is pretty historic for, for me and, and for the channel as well. So you guys are a part of history and, um, you know, this is just a brand new experience. So uh, forgive me for maybe not having the ship completely like hammered into, into shape. I'm kind of figuring it out as I go. And uh, I think I did some tests and I think I got it all. I got my ducks in, in enough of a row to, to carry on with tonight. So tonight's ultimately a um, bit of like a trial run um got some stuff to talk about got that ready to go but um you know i don't necessarily have a full program ready to go perfect things like listed to talk about but that's okay um still gonna have a lot of fun still gonna talk um given that this is my first time i don't really know how long this will go um i hope that you guys are able to stick around for the whole time if not to just listen in the background if you're driving or doing something at home and you just want to do dishes and, and listen to the stream at the same time that's totally cool um Let's see. Johnny, what's up, man? <laughs> uh, John, God for money, Python. Get on with it. I uh, love it. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, sweet. So uh, let's see. Looks like we got like five people in the lobby. <laughs> Josh, <laughs> talk about Funkos. Yeah. Um, as you can see here, if you guys don't know me, um, I am all about Funko Pops. This is my collection. I know there are people who have entire rooms full of Funko Pop figures, but uh, I've got just these two shelves here, uh, mostly Star Wars, Marvel, and some other smattering of pop culture references. Um, since we're talking about space tonight, um, maybe I'll feature a Funko Pop. Maybe that should be the thing. I'll feature Space Ghost. Um, Johnny, that's a shout out to you there. Um, got a little Space Ghost. I'll stick Space Ghost uh, in the frame right here. You see him in the corner? Uh, wait, bit, maybe better yet, uh, right about here. Space Ghost Coast to Coast. That's a classic, gosh, late 90s, maybe early 2000s. Cartoon Network late night show. Um, I love Space Ghost very much. Um, so yeah, uh, let's just get on with it here. Um, if you're brand new to the Orbital Alliance YouTube channel, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for spending your night here with me. And uh, I want to just explain a little bit about you know what this channel is and what you can expect and tonight like since it's the first time we've ever done this you know we're we're going to be talking about space uh which is the entire goal of this channel is to help you learn more about space so that one day you can go to space and that's my goal um i am just a space nerd by the way my name is nick i should probably introduce myself <laughs> um my name is nick and i'm a huge space nerd i am not uh, an astronomer uh, an astrophysicist, rocket scientist, and I'm certainly not an astronaut, um, but I think I would like to be all of those one day. <laughs> uh, the little kid in me is still uh, coming out every single day. I love to think about space, breathe space, read about space, watch space, and just exist around it. So I love to um, also share my excitement and, and passion and, and energy around space with other people. So back in January of this year, 2021, my goal was to actually make a YouTube channel about space. And that was actually a bit of a, a goal that I had probably five or six years ago. I remember driving home from work and I think I'm like, that's, I need to do that. I need to make a YouTube channel about space, uh, where I can share my excitement and thrill about, about all things outer space and space exploration. And I remember feeling this just like total like crunch that was like absolute terror and fear of what people were going to think of my my content and what people were going to think about how I was going to be you know sharing and it was that like self-conscious thing times a thousand um so I never did it and I wrote it down in notebooks I have notes all throughout my journals and my like electronic notes and it never came to fruition until this year I said beginning of the year new year's resolution let's do it let's make a youtube channel and thus the orbital alliance was born um and I Let's just talk about the name around it a little bit too. I, I wanted to call it the Alliance because it I wanted to signify you know, people coming together. Um, and I think that what better term to that is not only like you're coming together, it's not like it's just a gathering, but you're working towards a cause. Like you ally for 
the greater good. Um, and I think space is such a good representation of, um, you know, working towards the betterment of humanity with each other. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but I think I stuck with the word Alliance and then orbital meaning, you know, go around the earth. Um, we're all people who orbit, you know, we, we may not be in space orbiting the earth, but we are on the earth, which orbits the sun and the sun orbits the galactic center. You know, we're all moving right now. We, we might be still in our rooms or what have you, but, um, all of us are moving very, very, very fast around in, in space. And I think we're all orbiters, which is why if you're familiar with the channel and you've seen some of my videos, the opening to all my videos, I say, hello, orbiters, or what's up, orbiters? Um, what's up, people who orbit? Um, that is kind of like the go-to phrase for me because I think I just want to call out that, hey, don't forget you're moving in space too, whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not. Um, and it just adds a little bit of fun too. So I, I created this orbital alliance. Like we are in this together for each other, uh, sort of the, the explanation behind the name. Um, and you never know, it might take off into something much bigger than than I could ever expect. And I just think it's a sweet name that sounds spacey. So bonus. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, let's take a look. Who's Who else is here? Uh, Ron Colson, what's up, man? Get spaced out. Totally. That sounds like uh, we should be listening to some David Bowie. Um, Tony, <laughs> your content is out of this world. It would not be a Tony Thompson comment without a pun. So uh, good to see you, man. Thank you all for, for watching here. Um, let me see. I think I see seven people in, in the in the lobby. Eight, maybe eight. Um, that's great. You know, honestly, with with no benchmark whatsoever tonight, I was starting to get curious what tonight might look like. And um, I plan to be live for maybe 30 to 60 minutes. That's kind of my my estimate here. And I thought well, it'd be great to have like, um, you know, five or six people in here. That'd be good. That'd be a crowd. Uh, you know, and, and here we are. Oh, 10. We're at 10. Oh my gosh. Okay. So it's growing now. So things are starting to pick up. So my expectations are already blown out of the water, which is amazing. Um, so let's keep talking about the channel really quick. So if, again, if you're not familiar with, um, with the content on the channel, um, we do make all space related content and the goal is that it's for everybody. And whether you are just figuring out that you have an interest in space or whether you've been immersed in the space world, like I have for most of your life, um, you know, for decades, um, I wanted to have content that was friendly for whatever walk in your space journey that you're in. So, um, I started out with making videos called 60 seconds of space. So there's a series I have on my channel. You can find it there called 60 seconds of space. And the goal is that you can learn a nugget of space knowledge in a minute or less. And I've only got a couple of them on there. I'm still working to keep that series growing. Um, but if you ever wanted to learn what an asterism was, what's an astronomical unit, um, or you want to learn about the space station, you know, I can, you can watch any of those videos just like that and move on with your day. And that way you've grown just a little bit. So I think it kind of speaks to the core fundamental, uh, journey of the YouTube channel itself. It's like help you learn about space so that one day you can go to space. Um, so 60 seconds of space. There's also some vlogs that I have on the channel as well. Um, some of them are just discussions about space or kind of what's coming up on the channel. Um, and then I also have adventure vlogs, which are centered mostly around astrophotography, which is a huge hobby of mine. I love to go out and shoot photos of the night sky of the international space station, and hopefully one day rocket launches, which is a big goal. We'll talk about that. So, um, pardon me while I take a drink real quick. Um, so yeah, you'll find stuff about astrophotography too. So, uh, some instructions on, you know, how to do certain types of photography and also just kind of have some fun and follow along as I go out on adventures in the local area and kind of across the country to, to see, you know, different events and to try to capture them with, with my camera. I love doing that. It's my number one hobby. So, um, hopefully you just kind of get a sense of information, but also wonder. Um, and I hope that, you know, now that we're going to be live every Wednesday, every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Central, I hope that you guys can kind of get like a refresher of, uh, you know, what's what's new this week and you know what's out there to get excited about in, in, in regards to space. Uh, <laughs> Aunt Sharon, thank you. It is a, it is a cool name. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, I would hope that uh, I've done my work on the front end to, to achieve that status, but I, I ultimately need validation. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for uh, for shouting out that. That's awesome. Uh, Ryan Pribble, space, <laughs> right? That's the goal. Uh, indeed, space, indeed. 
everybody needs space. I actually just uh, came back from Kennedy Space Center two weeks ago, and I, uh, I mean, most of their merch at the store there at the Space Center is uh, has the tagline "I need my space" on it. So I actually got my mom a shirt that says "I need, need my, I need my space." It's like a night sleeping shirt, which was pretty awesome. Um, so we all need our space. Um, yeah. So let me like throw it here to. Um, yeah. Okay. I have an idea. So I have a video queued up for you guys that I thought would be fun to show. Um, I'm actually working on a bunch of brand new content for the channel uh, right now. And I've been spending a lot of hours editing. And these are a little bit different than the content that I've shown recently, which I'm, I'm make, is making it extra exciting. So one, I was super stoked to get off the ground with streaming. So this is like a big checkbox, like moving out of the way. I got three other videos coming up in the next two to four weeks if I'm lucky. Um, I talked about them in the most recent video I've put on the channel. Um, and if you've seen that, you know, I kind of gave a little bit preview there, but today you're going to get an extra bonus preview that was not revealed in the old YouTube video. So um, we've got uh, a 20 questions, kind of like AMA, ask me anything sort of video that's coming up. Uh, I've been, I'm editing that. I've also, as, as I mentioned, I went down to Florida. So I shot a vlog for that to go try to see the SpaceX Crew 3 rocket launch. So that's going to be exciting. And then the one I'm most excited about was uh, I went to the Yerkes Observatory in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin to see the world's largest refracting telescope. So um, I'm like maybe like eyeball deep in editing that right now. And I am like super thrilled with how that video is going. So I thought it would be super fun to kind of show you guys um, a little early preview, like a minute or so of the front end of the video, just so you guys can get a taste for it. I'm really, really, really hoping that it's going to come out by next week, Thanksgiving time, give or take. Um, if not by the end of the month, I just really am trying to do my best job on it and not rush it. So I might take extra time if I feel I need it, but the goal was Thanksgiving initially. And I feel like it's moving along. I just gotta keep logging hours like I am. So anyway, I'm gonna throw this to a video and then I'll come right back out to the, the camera shot. So enjoy this preview of my Yerkes Observatory uh, adventure vlog. All right, here it goes. What's up, Orbiters? It's Nick from the Orbital Alliance. It's great to see you guys. Today, you can tell I'm not in my studio. I am actually on location at the Yerkes Observatory in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, which if you don't know where that is, it's in the Midwest of the United States at the southern end of the state of Wisconsin. I'll show you here on the map. And it's a beautiful location, a getaway destination for, for people. They take weekends away. It's absolutely gorgeous. And it's a beautiful, chilly fall day. The foliage is amazing. Uh, but I'm here not to see the trees, but what is inside this beautiful building from the late 1800s. It actually is home to the world's largest refracting telescope. This particular telescope is under restoration and so is the rest of the building. So I decided to reach out to the folks at Yerkes and ask if I could come here and explore the building and check out the telescope because it's gonna blow my mind. So let's go inside and see the restoration work that they're doing on the facility and then learn about the gigantic telescope that they have in that dome. So come on with me. All right, what did you guys think? Uh, let me know in the comments if you're excited about that or not. If you uh, have any um, expectations or questions, uh, I can answer some of those right now. Um, it was a super, super fun day. Uh, my friend Tyler, who's helped me out with a lot of these videos recently, has uh, was joined me that joined me that day. He was the camera operator for that, um, and he kind of tagged along as as crew. And we explored the observatory. We got to talk to the director of the, the observatory and uh, we got to actually see the world's largest refractor telescope, which was, uh, you know, it's a marvel to sit next to. Um, so I kind of did a little bit of a tour. We got to, to have the place to ourselves really, which was awesome. And then uh, we got to yeah have an interview and just sort of learn a little bit more about the history and the future of it because it's being restored. There are renovations being done, which is, uh, was <laughs> Ryan, <laughs> I love that. Um, you should host those Disney World shows. Yeah, <laughs> I do want to host a Disney World show. That'd be awesome. Disney, hit me up. Um, we're not sponsored by Disney, so I'm just gonna put that disclaimer there. I wish I had a little text blurb to put at the bottom of the screen. Um, yeah, Josh, it was totally in Lake Geneva. I I didn't know that my entire life until someone told me a couple of years ago, and I was like, wait a minute, Lake Geneva, like. Like in our backyard, Lake Geneva, like an hour away, Lake Geneva, that's nuts. Like a piece of history that actually like is still holding the claim to the world's largest refractor telescope since the 1890s. That's incredible. And uh, I decided to make the effort. So I reached out to the guy and I was like, hey, can we come and actually like 
shoot a video where I can make a cool video for my channel, but also I can use it to help you promote the fundraiser for your uh, renovations, restorations, which are happening. It's actually a $20 million restoration project um, that a private foundation that owns the building now is, is undertaking. So pretty impressive uh, that that's even happening. Um, but anyway, the video is going to be great. I've, uh, I shot a lot of really cool b-roll as you saw there's a lot of drone footage because you just kind of need to see this video or the you need to see the uh the building in its full scale it's not worth it just see it from the ground right outside so i made sure i got some aerial photography done and uh <laughs> reflecting on the refractor <laughs> that's amazing ron i love it um i appreciate that sharon thank you <laughs> um yeah so anyway i thought you'd appreciate that preview hopefully you guys are excited and I, like I said, I'm hoping for another week or so, uh, week, maybe two weeks to get that one out, but it's coming along really nicely. I'd say probably about 50, 55% done with it. Um, so yeah, going to be sweet. Um, yeah. So how are you guys doing tonight? Um, having fun yet? Um, let's see, dude, we're at 12, 12 people hanging out. Thanks for joining us. If you're just joining us right now, uh, welcome to the stream. This is my very first live stream for myself on YouTube. So I've never done this before. This is also the very first live stream that the Orbital Alliance has ever had on the YouTube channel. So uh, you guys who are just showing up, you're witnessing history. Thank you for participating and being here tonight. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, I hope that you stick around throughout the stream. And even if you just can listen in uh, as you're doing house chores or driving or something like that, that is just fine as well. I'd love to ha hang out with you and Hopefully you guys are able to learn something tonight about space. So uh, with that, let's actually talk about space. Uh, let's move on. Um, I had some notes here where I, I thought, hey, it'd be fun to just talk about some of these things. Um, and I think the most important and most relevant thing is space news. Like what's going on in the space world right now? Um, it's funny, as I talk to people about space more and more, um, you know, just in everyday passing, I think people are kind of stuck in the past with, you know, where space currently is. Um, and they're not really up to date on what's happening uh, just in general, which is kind of surprising, but I guess it is a little bit niche. Uh, it's pretty focused, but there also hasn't been a lot of publicity until very recently uh, with some updating stuff. And even if you did hear it, you probably have no idea what people are talking about. So the most common misconception that I come across with uh, people in uh, conversation is that people still think that the space shuttle is flying. <laughs> Um, which is NASA's was NASA, which was NASA's flagship um, crew vehicle to get people into space for 30 years from 1981, but it actually retired in 2011. Uh, so fun fact: the, the space shuttle itself, all all of them that were in the fleet, have been retired since 2011. So uh, there actually haven't been human launches from American soil. Uh, since then up until last year in 2020. So it, there was a huge gap uh, where there, we weren't actually flying anybody from American soil. And that was pretty not like not, not really heard of, you know, in American history. Uh, just while everybody knows that we went to the moon uh, in the 60s, it's kind of a big thing. You think of Apollo, you think the giant Saturn V rocket, just about everyone can envision it. Obviously, that was that wasn't just monumental for NASA. That was monumental for human history. So pretty big. The space shuttle pretty close a lot of people just get it but most people when we talk about uh you know space are like oh yeah when's the next space shuttle going up i'm like well it went up 10 years ago <laughs> so um so yeah that's that's kind of a fun thing to to think about so today nasa is obviously one of the biggest players in the world with space and for the most part government agencies are you've got nasa for the united states you've got roscosmos which is the russian space agency and then you have ESA, which is ESA, but it's pronounced ESA, kind of like NASA. You don't say NASA, you say NASA, it's just like ESA uh, is the European Space Agency. And that's kind of the grouping of all sorts of countries over there in Europe, Italy, Germany, uh, the UK, um, France, uh, a smattering of others. They kind of have their own you know, group and organization, JAXA, J-A-X-A, which is the Japanese Aerospace Agency. Uh, they're a huge player. And uh, China is a, a resurging presence that is growing huge. They're doing a lot of stuff. I don't know exactly what the name of their organization or their like yeah, the organization or government agency is. Those are all big government players. Uh, but the thing in the 2020s and even in the mid 2010s that came to the surface is something that's never happened before, which is commercial space flight. Um, and by that, I mean the companies that are coming out of 
the blue who are who are now trying to provide solutions for space flight um for governments um for private contractors whatever it is military they're they're not tethered to the constraints of congress uh, at least in america you know deciding when and how much budget you get these private companies are now able to provide launch solutions uh, rocket boosters capsules who can deliver people capsules that they can deliver cargo satellite launches you name it these commercial players are actually kind of taking over the game and that's not a bad thing it's that that might sound like it's sort of like a competitor thing it is but it also isn't because the, they can work together to help move forward and that's really what's happening so uh, a lot of you may have heard in the news spacex which is uh, space exploration technologies which is elon musk's company uh they are definitely the number one player in the commercial realm and they have nasa contracts other companies like Boeing, you know, the airplane company has been working with NASA for decades, and they're also creating, uh, you know, a, a human-rated spaceship right now. Uh, Sierra, Sierra Nevada Corporation is another one. They just renamed Sierra Space. They they have the Dream Chaser spacecraft. That's really cool. Northrop Grumman. They've also been through different name iterations. They've bought out different companies. They're doing cargo deliveries. Um, Axiom is a new upcoming one. They're going to be doing. Uh, partnership with space, space SpaceX to launch humans to the space station to eventually build an attachment to the space station, which is really cool. Um, and uh, the yeah, they're they're a big player. Um, and there's a host of others. Um, you can keep going probably for another ten minutes just talking about all the different ones that are actually like doing big things. But um, the the world right now is is changing rapidly, and I would argue that 2021 is actually the most eventful year in space since 1969. And that's that's probably my my opinion. Um, there's been a lot that's happened over the decades, but uh, this so much has changed and so much so quickly has changed. Uh, events are actually taking place. A lot of things that happened this year uh, have been in the works or, you know, being built, constructed, trained, you know, prepared over the last five, 10 years. But just now they're finally happening, you know, ever since the space shuttle got got, uh, you know, retired. Uh, pardon me, you're here uh yeah kayla good question uh where can you see the shuttles now so originally space shuttles launched launch pun uh <laughs> they uh, they started with five of them they built five orbiters they called them orbiters and with the sixth technically but it was more of like a prototype tester um so you had atlantis endeavor um gosh atlantis endeavor discovery columbia and challenger now, Columbia and Challenger, when unfortunately, you know, we lost them to accidents, so they they blew up, and unfortunately, both crews of seven perished. One in the '80s, one in the 2000s, um, and the other three orbiters made it through all their missions. Um, and in total, there were 135 space shuttle missions, and they uh, they decommissioned the last three: Atlantis, Endeavor, and Discovery, and then they uh, put them in museums. So you can see Atlantis in Florida. Which, if you watch my upcoming vlog of visiting Kennedy Space Center, you can see Atlantis. I pay a visit to Atlantis. It's the second time I've seen it. It's amazing to see it in person. Uh, Discovery, I believe, is in the Smithsonian in DC, I think. I have not seen that one. And then Endeavor is in Los Angeles in California. I've seen that one as well. Uh, they all have kind of different layouts. They've like positioned them differently, so you kind of get a different experience with the different shuttle otherwise it's just really the name on the side that makes it different but um all of them are up for you to go see with the in a beautiful display so it's really really cool um to kind of get to wrap your head around the fact that these pieces of machinery were not only the most advanced pieces of machinery ever created at the time but they flew over a hundred million miles <laughs> literally like that sounds absurd uh but it's 133 million miles traveled i think for space shuttle atlantis um, which is just, I mean, did you imagine putting that on your odometer in your car, <laughs> you know, 133 million miles. I mean, most cars die after 200,000, but, uh, yeah. So space shuttles are, are crazy. Um, let's see. Yeah. So the, uh, let me just kind of wrap up that thought before I move on. Um, so let's see um yeah so space shuttles went down so nasa contracted out the commercial crew program to spacex and boeing to create um capsules that are human rated to take humans back up to the space station and beyond kind of through a commercial crew contract so <clears throat> spacex has been fulfilling that recently they've done 
three official launches taking NASA and other government agency astronauts up to space, which has been awesome. Um, Boeing has had some setbacks. They have they had a failure in one of their test flights, so they're still building their Starliner, which is their craft. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so they're... Um, Oh, why is space uh, travel exploration important? That's a good question. Let's definitely answer that. Um, so yeah, the, watching all these flights go up is really exciting because you know after having this sort of lull from 2011 down to you know now, basically 10 years later, it's like the excitement is doubled, tripled, quadrupled, which is pretty awesome. Um, you can really feel the energy when the launches are going off. To me, it's kind of like the Super Bowl. <laughs> like I don't watch sports much, but um, you know when I get excited about rocket launches i get really excited i like to you know get pumped and and maybe maybe i yell i don't know um but yeah it's 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 really cool to see where things are going you know spacex is also doing starlink launches which if you look on the channel too i have some videos about starlink which are satellites that are going to give internet connection anywhere in the world so they kind of create a network flying around in big lines so 60 satellites at a time they launch they go out and they spread out around the earth and they go in different orbits eventually there'll be a network covering the earth and you can uh, subscribe and get a uh, satellite dish that gives you high quality broadband internet uh, from anywhere in the world. You can be in the middle of the desert. You can be in the ocean. It really doesn't matter. As long as you have that dish, you can get high speed internet, which is awesome. So Starlink has been a really exciting venture. And those go up, gosh, every couple of weeks or every couple of months. Um, one just went up this past week. Uh, so another group of, I think, 57 this time, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's pretty exciting to, to watch what's going on. Um, yeah. So let's get back to that question. Uh, why is space travel and space exploration important? So that is definitely a loaded question um, because there are a lot of answers to it. I don't think there's just one answer, um, but I will touch, touch on this a little bit. Um, NASA has a concept called NASA spinoffs. Um, and ultimately why we're going to space and what we do up there right now is not just so that people can go do like somersaults in the air and, you know, kind of have fun for a couple of weeks <laughs> or a couple of months. Um, it's so that we can learn about the human body, learn about the earth, learn about the universe. Uh, so ultimately what we do is we experiment and we do science all the time, which is amazing. Um, you know, so all, what we want to do is to create advantages that we can't get on earth because having microgravity or zero gravity is, um, you know, it's, it's a way that you can, it's another angle. So you can do an experiment all day long on earth. And you might not find the answer unless you like go on the other side of it, right? Like maybe it's it's hidden, so to speak. And maybe the only way to achieve that perspective is to go to space uh, and look at it and how this thing or this object or this experiment reacts in zero gravity. And it's just a different way to look at it. And there's been a lot of experiments on, you know, bone density, um, you know, and how that deteriorates in space because you don't use your bones, you don't use like your your muscles entirely, so your bones get weak. Um, we're researching that so that we can cure things like osteoporosis here on earth, which is a huge problem. And you can look at that in a totally different way in space. Uh, so there's a ton of like medical, um, you know, lifestyle, um, and agricultural things you can do. Um, and NASA spinoffs are technically kind of the results of those experiments. Um, a lot of those things like MRI machines, um, a lot of medications that, you know, they might not exist. Things that actually have, I think microwaves, um, digital cameras like if you own a phone with a digital camera on the back um you can thank the space program for that that's a spin-off the digital camera was developed because of the space program um so you guys would all still be shooting on film uh if you know if that had not happened so nasa spin-offs are those byproducts that society and humanity has benefited from from the space program so i would say the an short answer that i would give to that is why is space exploration important um is because you can gain advantages that you can't otherwise gain you know, from space that would help humanity grow and develop um the unfortunate other way of developing is through you know warfare which is a, a really bad uh hum human byproduct um it has developed i mean the space program kind of exists because of of war but um you know i think space is a much more strategic and uh, humane way of going about developing you know, <laughs> human advances. So uh, let's let's work together towards eliminating war and achieving space exploration, so we can you know learn more about about how humans work and how humans can improve. What about Jeff Bezos? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Good point about that actually. So blue origin is another company that has come, come to the surface recently. Um, they've been around for a while, but they've only just been doing human flights, uh, to sub orbit, which is not quite around the earth. It's just kind of an arc and kind of come back down. Kind of like if you were to launch a rocket in your backyard, watch it go up, call it fall back down that just scaled up. And with people on the top, um, blue origin by Jeff Bezos, who has, uh, you know, is the, creator of Amazon uh, and was formerly the CEO until he just stepped down from that position. I think earlier this year, um, he's been, he's been a big player. It's been a tricky situation for blue origin. Um, they've been going through a lot of PR troubles and uh, it's been, you know, hard to watch a little bit if you're kind of an advocate for space, but I think they're turning around. They've got a rocket new shepherd, which is the suborbital one where they kind of hop into space, launch people up in a capsule and then have them come back down the earth. Um, new, new, this new Shepard, new Glenn is their orbital rocket and they're just wheeling out their first test rocket in Kennedy space center. I just missed that one by days. Actually, I came back from Florida and then, you know, bang, they're, they're rolling that out from their facility. I saw their blue origin facility, which was cool. Um, so hopefully we'll see a lot more from them very soon. Um, so yeah, 2021 really, really exciting. And, uh, it's just certainly not going to slow down anytime soon. So you guys be, uh, be on the lookout for really cool things. Um, let's see who else we've got in the chat here. Yeah, first rule when we land on Mars, no war is allowed. Agreed. And I think it will be that way for a very long time. Um, gosh, I mean, there's no way to properly predict that. My hope is that it would be that way. It would be a pretty peaceful experience for the first maybe century of settlement. Um, I, it's unfortunately inevitable. You just know that there's going to be some form of conflict. Um, but uh, suddenly remembered Mars attacks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hopefully there are no like big headed aliens waging war on us uh, up there. But uh, yeah, so it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a tricky thing to navigate. I think there'll be a lot of effort put into Mars society, how they will cooperate and support each other. Um, and have contingencies in place for when there are disagreements, um, you know, for territory or what have you. Um, it'll be tricky, but we'll get there. Um, let's see. So you guys have any uh, other questions? So let me know what you guys are thinking about here. Uh, again, if you guys are just hopping in here on the, the stream, welcome. This is the Orbital Alliance. This is my uh, passion project to help others learn about space and to help, uh, you know, help you learn so that one day you can go to space, which is my goal as well. So hopefully we can all go together in an alliance. It's the Orbital Alliance. So uh, feel free to, to chime in on the chat, ask some questions about space, and uh, we'll just continue the discussion. I'll probably plan to be you know live here for maybe another 25 minutes uh, if, if things are feeling good. Uh, this is, again, the first stream we've ever done here on the channel. So we're trying to keep it uh, concise, but also free. So let's uh, let's keep going. I've heard space peeps talking about dry water. What's the difference between ice and dry water? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure I know what uh, dry water is. Um, unless you're dry ice, like like frozen nit nitrogen. Is that what dry ice is? Um, I'd have to look that up. Sorry, Johnny. <laughs> I wish I, I wish I knew the answer. Like like discovering dry water. Um, yeah, I mean, unless it's ice, I mean, like water ice. Um, that would be maybe I'll have to look that up. Maybe we can answer that next time. Um, not too sure. Space debris, Ron. That's a that's a huge timely news thing going out right now. Space debris. So, um, we've been launching stuff into space since 1957, since Russia got successfully got its first orbital satellite, Sputnik. Uh, so we've had, you know, what is that? What's the math? Uh, 67, 67, 97, 2007, 17. Yeah, 60. 60 plus years of you know things flying around the earth which with that comes space trash or space debris uh pieces of rockets uh decommissioned rockets you know, dead satellites satellites that have exploded and failed all this junk and ranging from whole satellites to tiny little metal shards that have broken off are all floating around the earth there's a huge cloud around the earth and you can't really see it if you walk outside because it's so small and it's all moving so fast tens of thousands of miles per hour uh, they're all like little bullets, which makes it incredibly dangerous to actually launch things into space, let alone launch people into space. 
Uh, you have to get into this um, into a safe place, and it's really, really tricky, and it's becoming more and more tricky over time, um, which is, uh, you know, not a good thing. Luckily, uh, there haven't been any fatalities due to space debris. Um, we've been pretty cautious, and the people who are in space can generally be warned when a large piece is uh, going to interact in their orbit, and they can maneuver out of the way in time. There's they keep track of that stuff, but in particular, uh, the space station, the International Space Station. Uh, which is the orbital outpost, which was created by over 15 different nations, which has been in orbit for 22 years ish, 20, 20, 21, 22 years. Um, and it's also had a continuous human presence on it since the year 2000. And it just hit 21 years for that, um, which is, has never happened. It's a, it's a, a continuing streak. There's constantly people on there. They send them up, they bring them down, they send them up, bring them down. Um, Obviously, with that long of a presence, you run the risk of hitting space debris. The space station does actually get pummeled all the time by debris, and you can see little like bullet holes on the space station. And luckily, nothing gets through because they have shielding. Um, if there was a big enough object uh, in the right angle, it could actually be detrimental to human life, and that's not a good thing at all. Um, they do prepare crews to go to their lifeboats, per se, their ships, uh, if they see something coming, just in case the station gets hit. Uh, if it does get hit, then they can just close the hatch prevent any like air leaks or you know depressurization of the capsules and then they can just detach and come back home and just ditch the station which is even though it costs you know over 100 billion dollars it's better to lose that than to lose human life so uh recently this week huge news of space debris um there was a anti-satellite test launched by russia uh the, the military the russian military not roscosmos the space agency uh, to test what it would look like to launch a missile up and blow up a satellite in space. They tested on one of their old 1980s decommissioned dead satellites, um, but it created a cloud of 1,500 plus trackable pieces of debris in space. Unfortunately, very near to the orbit of the space station. Um, it put our crews up there, including Russian cosmonauts, into peril. So they've been kind of on standby for a couple of days, like, as they learn about how where the trajectories of this debris cloud that's happening, really really scary stuff. Um, and it's been all over space news that's been kind of like a, a kind of a foolish move by Russia to do that because they put their own people at risk. They're putting other uh, astronauts at risk from other other countries and other agencies. Um, been really really tricky to to navigate. And hopefully they find a good solution. Um, there are a lot of companies out there trying to solve the space debris debris problem where they find ways to collect it or deorbit it safely. So it burns up in the earth's atmosphere and it doesn't harm anybody or any other satellites. Uh, hopefully one day we find a good solution for that. Cause it is, it is very dangerous, can kill people. Luckily it hasn't. And let's hope that it doesn't anytime soon. Um, what planet would I visit first? That's a good question. Um, so I, gosh, I mean, Mars makes the most sense just from practicality standpoint. So I'm probably see Mars, but I've always wanted to go to, you know, a moon of Jupiter, a moon of Saturn, just to experience what it looked like to have a planet in the sky, you know, as big as those two are. Um, that would be, I mean, every time you see like concept art people have made, you know, just throughout history of like sitting on, you know, maybe Enceladus uh, around Saturn or, you know, standing on the surface of, um, Ganymede and around Jupiter and you can see this monstrosity of a planet like we got our little moon which is really big compared to the earth but it's so far away that it's this tiny little dot um you know kind of don't really get the scale for how big the moon is because it's so so distant but I think I'd probably hit up Mars because at least it's close to home and you can come back uh, and the second I would make another hop and go back out to the moon of Jupiter and then hopefully take another hop out to Saturn that'd probably be my answer to that uh, what's up, Mabry? Um, all the launch or all the launches in Florida. If so, why? Great question because um, not all of them are from Florida. NASA primarily launches from Florida in Cape Canaveral Kennedy Space Center. Um, there are also other sites. Um, so let me explain Florida first. When NASA was first birthed in the 50s, it was NACA actually, um, and they were kind of the I can't remember what the C actually stands for, but they explored aerospace and, and space flight. When they became NASA, they kind of had to plant and figure out where the best place would be. It's, it turns out it's actually the best to launch from the equator or as close to it as you can get. And if you're in the United States, the southernmost areas that you can get to for rocket launches are in probably South Texas and Florida. Um, and the reason for that is you get the most kind of gravitational throw. Um, 
imagine if you were holding a bowling ball by you and you started spinning like really fast, like just standing in place, just spinning. If you held the ball above your head, it wouldn't be that hard. If you held the ball out lower to your equator per se down by your waist and you spun around much harder to hold on and if you spun really fast and let go that ball would go flying it wouldn't go flying if you're holding it over your head same reason with rockets get closer to the belt of the earth as it's spinning you can throw it and it saves you a lot of energy uh, when doing those launches and you can keep things going getting going faster more quickly and you can keep them that way so that's kind of the the short answer uh, for that. So NASA is there. I think there's also wallops on the East coast, which I think is in Virginia, um, Vandenberg air force base in California, which is also pretty far South in the LA area. They launch from, from there, uh, SpaceX launches from there sometimes, um, mostly Florida, other places around the world, Russia launches from Kazakhstan, which is, you know, probably the Southern it's the southernmost part. It's another country, you know, below Russia. So they even moved South to get to a better launching point for that. Um, French Guiana, I think that's how you say that. There's another launching point there, which is in, you know, the upper part of South America there. So there's, again, get to the equator. That's, that's the big, uh, the big goal. Uh, which planet would be the hardest to visit? Uh, gosh, <laughs> well, that depends on whether or not you consider Pluto a planet. <laughs> I think that's, uh, I mean, I do. And if you've seen some of my videos, I, I really still wish Pluto was a planet. Um, I know the International Astronomical Union who decides that has a lot of good reasons. And I respect those. Um, back in 2006, when they demoted Pluto from planetary status to dwarf planet status, I mean, I definitely think pl Pluto would be the hardest. Um, it's in an, uh, like a, an awkward orbit. It's not on the right plane. Um, it's so far out. It's annual, you know, period. Okay. The year is so like, it's so long. I don't know what it is. hundred some, 200 some years. Like none of us will be alive to see one year for Pluto. Um, so I think just that alone would be hard. Plus you have to go through a lot of space debris, comets, asteroids, stuff like that to get, get up there. That'd be really tough. Um, so that'd be the, the short answer, I think. Um, yeah. So let me go back to the space station real quick. Um, I love the space station. It's like my favorite thing about space flight because it's so close to home. It's only 240, 250 miles up in the air. So think about that. 240 miles compared to the moon, 238,000 miles. Moon's way further away. It would take three, four days to get to the moon. You can get to the space station in six hours. That's a road trip. <laughs> you know, you can, uh, you can really get there quickly and you're in space and you get beautiful views of the earth. Um, and it's kind of like, it's like traveling across the street. Like if you want to go to your neighbor's house, that's like going to the space station in space language. If you want to go to the moon, that's like going to the next town. Uh, if you want to go to the next planet, that's like traveling across your country, wherever you live. If you live in the U S like if you want to go to Mars, like that's like driving from, you know, New York to LA. <laughs> it's going to take you like two days to get there. Um, so to speak, maybe scale it up relatively to that, but, uh, you know, it's, um, I think the space station is just such a, a wonderful thing that has given so many advantages and, and um, you know, different perspectives to humanity. Um, it's allowed people to quickly get to space in, in mass numbers. Uh, as I mentioned, it's been up there holding humans in it since 2000, November, 2000. So 21 years. Um, so that means you can get people up there quickly, get them back. You can do extended stays in space for six months to a year. Um, you can do a lot, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and if something goes wrong, you're not too far from home. Uh, you can come right back, which is awesome. Uh, but I also just love the way it looks and I'm going to, I'm going to get something really quick and show you guys. Um, I'm hoping this doesn't break on live stream because that'd be really terrible. <laughs> but I built the uh, Lego space station last year. Um, let me turn it around here so you guys can see. This is what the International Space Station looks like. Um, there's a series of modules in the middle, which were all assembled one by one over 20 years. Uh, and then, you know, got this truss segment over here on the side, which has all the solar panels on this side vertically here. Um, there are no people in this truss that goes along uh, horizontally here. The uh, forward and back is where all the people live and work and all the laboratories. I'm just going to throw it here in a video to you guys that, uh, that I made about this. I just love the way it looks. I love the solar panels. They're my favorite part of the space station. Uh, they are, of course, what provides the power and energy for the space station. It's completely neutral. You can't bring fuel to space, you know, that is like, hey, let's turn on a generator and, <clears throat> you know, 
uh, you know, burn gasoline while we're, uh, we're up here. We need to make clean, renewable energy. And I just think it is such, it's the personality of the space station. It's, it's the shape. Otherwise, it'd, be, it'd just be a bunch of tin cans kind of stitched together. Um, I think it'd be kind of silly, but uh, it looks beautiful. It is super radiant. And we can talk a little bit about how you can see the space station from where you live. You can see it pretty much from anywhere on planet Earth. So I'm just going to put this down over here so I don't break it. And I'll put that back up there later. Um, so the space station really quick. Um, I'll get to some of these other questions here in a moment. Excuse me. Um, so you can see the space station with your naked eye. It's super close. It's super bright. It's brighter than any star that you can see. Um, brighter than most planets that you can see. Not as bright as the moon, of course, but uh, you can see it all the time. Uh, most passes are somewhere between one and six minutes You know, from horizon to horizon as it goes above you. Um, it's amazing. And uh, it's my favorite thing to do recreationally is to just see the space station. I actually keep a log of all the space station sightings I've ever had uh, since 2012. And Johnny, you were actually there for that. So if you're still watching Johnny, um, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty nuts. Um, we were, we were there, you were at my, my parents' place. We were actually, uh, I had just gotten my iPhone 4S and I got, got the NASA app and it told you we can see space station sightings. And we went outside and we saw it go right over our heads, which was awesome. So I've kept all the data in a spreadsheet and it's the nerdiest thing that I do by far, <laughs> um, as I keep a log. And still to this day, I keep a log of every sighting. I track all the data and I log it. And since 2012, so almost, it's like nine years. I have seen the space station 129 times, um, which is crazy to me. I think it's been so many, but uh, I just want to keep going. Uh, eventually, the space station will deorbit when they realize it can't be used anymore, and that will be a really, really sad day. I'm definitely going to shed tears. It feels like a person to me. Um, I've learned so much about it, seen so many people inside it. I've seen it enough. It's like one of my friends at this point. Maybe that's sad. I don't know, but it's, uh, it's a marvel, and I just I love it very, very much. So... Let me throw it to a video here really quick for you guys. I, I queued this up um, so that you guys can see, um, you know, what the space station is about. It's about, a, it's one of my 60 seconds of space videos on the channel. So uh, enjoy this video here about the International Space Station. 60 seconds of space. What is the International Space Station? The International Space Station, or ISS, is the single largest object ever assembled in outer space by humanity. It's also the most expensive piece of equipment ever spent on by humans, costing it over $100 billion. Yes, that is with a B. The very first piece of the space station went up in 1998, set up by Russia. That's 22 years. We've had people on the space station ever since November 2000. So as of right now, at the time of this video being made, humanity has had a presence in space for 20 continuous years. I mean, that's awesome. Doesn't that blow your mind? The station exists so that science can happen in an environment that Earth can't produce, microgravity. And the best part is that the space station can be seen from almost anywhere on the planet. That means you can see it too. It orbits the Earth 16 times a day. One orbit is about every 90 minutes. In the comments below, be sure to let us know if you've seen the International Space Station fly over your house. I'd love to hear about that. And just like the space station orbiters, I will see you on the other side. Right. That's one of my uh, early, early videos from the channel earlier this year. Um, 60 seconds of space video, which uh, again, you can go find the playlist of that on the channel. There's a couple more that are in there. I'm hoping to make more in the future, but I feel like that was a good quick way to kind of get what the space station is to you guys uh, in a really short amount of time. Um, and yeah, Tony, to answer your question, is that uh, the actual size of the space station? Unfortunately not. But that leads to the fact, the fun fact that the space station is actually about the size of an American football field. So I'm not sure how that compares to maybe the rest of the world with uh, soccer slash, you know, football, football pitches out there. But um, it's pretty massive with the solar arrays. It's a really, really huge piece of equipment. Easily the biggest thing that's ever been assembled in space. Um, so space station is awesome. Can't get enough of it. Um, so yeah, you can find out how to see that too from your your place by using you know spotthestation.gov, which is a NASA service. You actually look on there on a map, tells you the time and date, uh, what areas of the sky to look, the east or west. You know how high up will it appear, how high up will it disappear. Uh, really, just learn a little bit about it, and it's super easy to interpret. And then you can go out and see it, and it's free. It's free entertainment. It's a couple minutes at a time. Just gotta have good weather and be in the right place, and you can see the space station. And when you go when you go see it, be you know kind of kind of marvel at what you're looking at because it's like, dude, there are people on that. Like, 
as it going over you're like there's like six people on that there's 14 people on that whatever it is at any given time now um it's just nuts that's going 17,000 miles per hour carrying people around the earth 16 times a day uh so you know you see a lot of sunrises and sunsets pretty incredible uh there was a crew rotation recently and they've just brought up some new people and it's fun to see what they're doing the last crew had a French commander, which was awesome. That was, that was really cool. Thomas Pesquet, he posted a lot of really, really cool pictures. Um, a lot of the Aurora Borealis and Northern Lights, maybe even some of the Southern Lights too, Aurora Australis. Um, he did some amazing photography. So look him up on social media, Thomas Pesquet. It's like Thomas, uh, but in, uh, it's like Thomas Pesquet, <laughs> but in French, you drop the consonants at the end. So it's Thomas Pesquet. And uh, he's an amazing photographer, posts a lot of really, really cool things. Um, I see a couple other people have, have joined the stream. Welcome everybody to the Orbital Alliance YouTube channel. This is uh, the very first time that we've streamed. So thanks for joining and uh, being a part of our, our channel's history here. If you have questions, sound off in the comments. Let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll do the best I can to answer everybody um, or at least get to most of them. Um, and uh, hopefully you guys learned something about space today. Uh, so let's go back here. Uh, thoughts on aliens. Um, gosh existential questions here um i want aliens to exist i think it'd be awesome do i want combative and violent aliens absolutely not i think it's there's a lot of potential to um have you know growth and expansion and support from another species that is spacefaring um and coming from from josh here i know that you are about mass effect i am about mass effect and i would love to see a council of species and a you know a hub a space station hub of all the different species working together living together i think it'd be amazing so thoughts on aliens i want them to exist um uh matt matt b i i, I spin launch uh i don't know necessarily what that is sorry um i'll have to look that one up um hey steph thank you so much um where is your patreon i just started a patreon um it's i know it's early but i decided hey let's let's make this a thing so if you guys are um finding my channel helpful useful you want to support the channel and the content that's being made on youtube you can subscribe to my patreon in the different forms that are there uh, there are some returning gifts for the different tiers that you participate in and that you can find the patreon link in the uh, about section on my youtube channel so you can see that there you can also find it in the bios of my social media on twitter and instagram and you can pick a different pay grade if you wish to help support financially. Um, some of the returns that you guys can get, some of the gifts, the givebacks are, um, you know, astrophotography photos that I've taken. Um, it's actually a really great segue here. Um, you, you can get a, in those, you, you can get some papers that you can, or the words, you can get some pictures to use as wallpapers um, for your phone, for your back, your desktop backgrounds, you know, whatever you want. Um, and there's different tiers that go up from there. So would appreciate your guys, your guys support. If you guys felt that was how you wanted to, you know, get behind us here and become part of the Alliance even more, that'd be amazing. But of course, absolutely no pressure. Uh, financial, uh, you know, standing is, is difficult these days. I totally get it. So, uh, whatever is up to you, that is fine. Um, $50 a month for a night looking at the stars with Nick. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's do it. 50 bucks. <laughs> um, hopefully you're local because that would be even more expensive if you had to fly in because unfortunately I can't afford to fly you guys in if you're remote. I'm sorry, guys. Um, so let me throw it to a screen share here really quick. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures that I've taken myself. So speaking of the International Space Station, you can, of course photograph the space station, which is one of the things I love to do. And there are different ways to do that. So I'm going to jump to my website here and show you um, some of my photos. So I'm going to screen share here. Um, hopefully you guys can still hear me. I, I see some levels there. So that's good. So here's my website. Um, so this right here uh, is one of my favorites. I made a video about this. You can see it on the channel from March. Uh, this is an International Space Station Lunar Transit. And a transit is where the space station passes in front of the moon or the sun and from your perspective on earth. So it kind of like passes, so it flies right in front of it. If you happen to be in the right space at the right time, you can see that happen. And if you're pointing a camera at it at the right right, right time, then you get a picture of it in this case. So um, you can see right here, a series of dots may not be that resolved for you on your screens, but um, you can see the solar panels and the modules and the different, you know, the light reflecting off it, there's color. Um, I took a series of still photos in burst mode on my camera. So I zoomed in with a 600 millimeter 
um, camera lens and got real close to it. I timed it perfectly. Um, and then I held down the shutter and it just took bursts like, you know, so all those individual pictures, I then stack them in, in post-production, uh, back in my computer and create this composite image. So, uh, this is, uh, one of my favorites. And again, you can see that video on the YouTube channel on the Orbital Alliance, uh, back from March, there's a lunar transit vlog on there. Uh, you can see exactly how I captured this image, which is, which is super cool. It was an amazing night, perfectly clear. Um, I've never been more happy to be in a Home Depot parking lot. <laughs> um, cool. Here's another one. This one's hard to see, but there's a, a special bonus. You can see it, this was a smaller pass. Um, so the space station is a shadow. The difference between this one is that this one's lit up. They call it illuminated. Um, just based on your position and where the sun is reflecting, but this one is a uh, shadow. So the little dots here, uh, right by the, uh, the moon or the space station, it's also in burst mode. So, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six images stacked here to, to show the space station. But there's a bonus. Um, if you look all the way up here in the corner, there's a little red dot. Uh, that red dot is actually Mars. It was a special night. There's a, a lunar and Mars conjunction, which means they're passing each other in the sky. Uh, again, from our perspective, it's kind of like almost a transit. Um, but there happened to be a lunar transit just as Mo the moon passed Mars that night. And I think that was like midnight on a random Tuesday or something like that. I went out to go get it. Um, well worth it. Very cool shot. Very rare shot that I was able to get. This does not happen often. The moon rarely passes planets that closely. Um, and believe it or not, when I showed up for this photo, the moon was right under Mars. So the moon moves so quickly in the night sky that by the time I got there to the actual opportunity for the space station, like 40 minutes later, it moved over to the left, it's like just that much. Pretty crazy. Here's a solar transit in front of the sun. You have to have a special solar filter in front of, uh, uh, you know, in, in front of your uh, camera or your telescope to, to see, to look at the sun even so you don't fry out your camera sensor or your eyes, which is even worse. Um, but there's a space station with the solar panels, you know, it's a silhouette passing right in front of it. You even see a little sunspot there, which is pretty cool. I love doing solar transits because they're in the middle of the day. You don't have to be up late. Um, and they're just beautiful to look at. You can see solar features and everything. Here's another one I took. Same thing from a different angle, different location. Uh, you know, it's usually six or seven. My camera takes six or seven still frames per, per second. Uh, so that's about, and let's comment on that. These photos happen very quickly. Because the space station move, is moving so quickly, um, you get usually about one second or less, sometimes half a second for this to happen. It goes right in front of the sun and you're done. If you miss it, you miss it. Sorry, you gotta wait maybe a couple weeks or a month or two or three to try again. Um, it happens often, but not often enough. Um, so each of these are stacked, it's a second or less. Um, here's another solar transit, super fun. Here's one with just one single image of the space station right in the middle. And then this is another kind of photography you can do. This is actually a still photo that I took of the space station, um, or it's at least a still frame. Um, there's a couple different strategies here, but this is it. You can see the solar arrays. I took this, you know, from my backyard, uh, my driveway in the front. Uh, you can do this with a telescope and a camera. It's really amazing what you can do with this stuff. Um, so I got a couple of different still images I've taken. They're really fuzzy, but you know, you're again, you're looking at something that's you're taking a picture of something that's 250 miles away <laughs> um, and it's moving at 17,000 miles per hour. So you do your best to get the best resolution and sharpness that you can. You can see the modules and the radiator panels on there. Um, pretty cool. And then the other type of space station photography is long duration exposures. So I've done a bunch of these. These are also a favorite. Um, you're not zoomed in. You're not trying to capture a specific tiny second. It's a much longer, more chill type of space station photography and probably the best to start with, if you ask my opinion. Um, here's a landscape nearby to my house and you see those streaks going across the sky. That's the space station. Uh, this is a, co a composite of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, ten, maybe 15 second exposures and I stacked them all in post. Um, so you let the exposure open the shutter. The light burns in the sensor over 15 seconds, creating a streak. Shutter closes, open another one, 15 more seconds, shutter closes, another one, and so on. Stack them all, get a beautiful landscape. It helps you see you know, the environment you're in while it's happening. So here's another one. This is from last year with Comet Neowise in the foreground. Well, I guess the space station is the foreground. It's in the background. Um, this is the comet that was, uh, this was, this photo was taken at like three in the morning. I got up super early. There's a still pond here in the town of Huntley, you know, the water tower. Um, 
you can see the, the comet here and then the space station flew by. And the cool thing is you can see the brightness change in the space station right about here. It gets brighter. I'm not sure how well you guys can see in the stream. I know the quality probably nerfs it a little bit. Um, it gets dimmer and then brighter and then brighter and brighter and then starts getting dimmer as it, the sun reflection uh, sort of fades away on it. Um, I like to think about airplanes. If you're out in the middle of the day and you see an airplane, like a jet plane flying by, depending on where you are and how fast it's moving, you see glints from the sun because it kind of reflects like a mirror. Same thing happens with the space station. It gets brighter and dimmer based on the angles. Here's one down in uh, Arizona at a dark sky park coming out of the sunset. This is actually the sunset here in the corner. Um, you can see the space station coming right into the darkness of the sky, um, right in the middle of the desert. And those are car lights in the horizon. Uh, there's a road back there. So those are headlights. And again, another series of probably 10 to 15 second shots. Here's another one just nearby. I think that, that's actually the moon, the bright spot here. The moon uh, is exposed into the, the picture. Here's another one in the desert, some saguaro cactuses in Arizona. Space station going right over. That was a really fun one. This is one of my first ones. Um, and it's kind of crummy, but I love it. Um, the composition to me was always interesting. I made it black and white. Um, you can see the sensor noise on my camera. It's just blown way out of proportion uh, just to get the streak of the space station going here. Um, I was hoping it would go through the basket, but I was not in the right place at the right time. I didn't, I didn't move the camera quickly enough. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing at the time. And I still think it makes for a really cool photo and the green kind of makes it look old school. So I was okay with it still in my portfolio. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to move back here. We're kind of getting, it's nine o'clock. Um, probably gonna wrap up here soon, but yeah, I love astrophotography. I love, uh, taking photos of the space station and there's all different ways you can do it. Um, if you guys have more questions about that, I would love to do another live stream where we talk just about astrophotography in more detail. So we can do that too. Um, yeah. So let's see, let me just take a look at my notes here real quick. Airball. Yeah. 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 yeah it was, it did feel like an airball at that moment for sure. Um, cool. So I got a couple other things I can think of. Uh, something I want to do in these live streams is kind of recommend some like next steps for learning about space for you guys. Um, and I think the best way to do that is kind of just do the little things that you can at home. It doesn't, doesn't mean you need to go, uh, go to space camp per se to like actually like, you know, learn about space. Um, so I think, you know, watching movies, reading books, um, watching YouTube videos and listening to music kind of are easy ways, free ways for the most part that you can, or at least like really, really, really inexpensive ways you can get to learn and grow in your journey towards, you know, space exploration. So what I want to do is start with this. I did make a video recently on the channel, so go check it out too. It's the, uh, I think it's three movies that you should, all space nerds should watch. Um, so check that out. And I'm actually going to throw it to one of the movies I talked about in there. I know it's unoriginal, but I believe in this movie so much that I actually want to talk about it in person. So, um, October sky, uh, with Jake Gyllenhaal, Laura Dern, Chris Cooper, uh, really great cast. This is from 1999, I think, 98, 99, I think 99. Um, amazing, amazing movie. Uh, great for families. So if you're out there with a family, you got kids, um, like it's it's pretty PG. So it's it's pretty safe. There's a few little you know blurbs of, of language in there. So keep that in mind. So maybe not for like tiny children, um, but uh, yeah, amazing movie about the wonder of space, about a, a boy from Colwood, West Virginia, who is destined to work in coal mines when he gets excited about space, learns to build rockets and, you know, starts his journey towards eventually becoming a NASA engineer uh, and training astronauts. And really, and he's he's a real person. It's based on a real, true story. Amazing uh, the way it captures, you know, simplicity and emotion in a movie. So October Sky, totally watch that. Um, that's kind of your homework for the week. Uh, next, a book that I finished recently, and I think I talked about this in a, another video too, um, Spaceman by Mike Massimino. He's a retired NASA astronaut. He is probably one of the most relatable people you'll ever come across. And in particular, you know, in the astronaut core uh, for NASA, highly experienced. He did two space shuttle missions to the Hubble Space Telescope to do repairs, highly specialized. Um, he's from New York. He's a really just down to earth, easygoing guy, uh, but also a really, really smart PhD, you know, intelligent, um, intelligent astronaut, really great at what he does. And I listened to his podcast, two funny astronauts. Uh, he hosts that with Garrett Reisman, another, uh, retired astronaut. And, uh, this book is, uh, just the story of his life. It's his, it's his autobiography, but it also helped me gain a little bit more clear of a sense of what it takes to become an astronaut from nothing. And that's really the state I'm in too. Like I, I want to be an astronaut one day. I want to actually go to space. 
um, that playing field is changing, but uh, I don't know the starting point for that. And he didn't either. And he kind of forges his own way that was unique to him and not anyone else. So really inspiring. I love it. So I would recommend Spaceman. Uh, definitely a book for you know adults. It's not a children's book. It's a full you know novel. But anyway, amazing. Um, in terms of music, I would recommend the band M83. Uh, M83 is kind of like a <clears throat> techno, not techno, but it's like an electronic. I don't have the right electronic trance ambient, um, you know, type of thing. So it's yeah, it's all electronic music, digital music, and there are some really really spacey themes in there. Some of them are really weird and more like '80s pop, but um, what's lower your eyelids to fall at the sun? I gotta look at it, look it up again. Um, uh, lower your eyelids to die with the sun. That song, that is a really cool, all instrumental song by M83. Lower your eyelids to die with the sun. Definitely check that one out. That, I recommend that. Um, if you're thinking about space, go outside, look at the stars at night, put your earbuds in, put this on full blast and you will just be like, what the heck? Even better if you get the space station in that moment too. So, uh, highly, highly recommended. Um, yeah. Great. So I think that's, those are the three things I would uh, recommend to you guys for right now. So it's after nine o'clock. Uh, I'm going to call it here for the night. If you guys have any final questions, uh, send them in the, the chat. Uh, explosions in the sky. Yeah, Tony, I, I, I've heard about that. Um, I don't know them. That song, band, I think it's a band, right? Uh, let me know here in the chat. Um, I've heard that's also a, a spacey thing. Maybe you've told me about them. I'm sorry about that. Um, so watch October Sky, read Spaceman by Mike Massimino, and listen to M83. Get in the space mood. Really, uh, you know, build it into your culture and make it exciting. Um, so, yeah, again, thank you guys for tuning into the live stream. My very first one here on the Orbital Alliance. My first one personally. I think this went great. I really appreciate every single one of you watch. Looks like we had, uh, you know, concurrent viewers it was like 15 or 16 at once which is great like i said it was i was expecting maybe five or six at the most and yeah we kind of sort above that so great first benchmark uh it is a band thank you for the confirmation johnny um explosions in the sky um i really appreciate you know all the time you guys have put in uh to the channel again stick around for really more like a lot more exciting content the the yerkes observatory vlog that's coming out my adventure vlog to the space coast in kennedy space center in florida uh the 20 questions ask me anything video that's coming up there's a lot to do uh we're gonna be streaming live every wednesday night now just to talk about space answer some questions um you know kind of just figuring this out as i go i hope to have you know some prepared content and eventually get to the point where we can bring in like a zoom caller and do some like q and a's with some more people of more uh expertise than I, I have. I, I love space. I study space, but I am no expert. Um, I would love to one day get an astronaut in here and actually have, uh, you know, a guest speaker or get an astrophysicist some, or an engineer, someone who works at NASA, um, you know, to come in here and, and, and talk about stuff in space. So I think that'd be amazing. So that's kind of the, the place I have going for this. So the live streams are going to be great. Um, yeah. And if you, if you haven't already, I would love it if you would subscribe to the channel. Um, Stick, so you don't miss any content that comes up. You can click the little bell in the corner and that will uh, actually, let me show you the little promo here. Um, so yeah, click the red subscribe button and you can, and the little bell next to it and you can get subscribed and uh, notified when a new video gets posted. It'll send you a little notification to your phone and uh, you won't miss any content, which is great. Um, let me see if I'm missing anything from my notes. Yeah, nothing else. It's kind of loose. Um, yeah. So great. Uh, thank you all again. Really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, just thinking about having a good night. Life is uh, what you make it. Make it epic, right? Uh, so I'm glad we were able to do epic things tonight. <laughs> um, so thanks for those who participated in the chat. You guys have been great helping me uh, get some content here. That was awesome. And uh, have a wonderful night. And until the next video on the Orbital Alliance... I will see you all on the other side.